federal debt ceiling. We hear congressional Democrats, Obama spokesmen, and a few spineless Republicans make claims that the federal debt isn't a problem. Obama representatives and congressmen claim that raising the debt ceiling is necessary to keep Granny in her wheelchair. This graph shows the federal debt since the turn of the 20th century. Measuring the rate of recent growth, an increase in the debt ceiling of $2 trillion would only last a bit over a year before the ceiling would have to be adjusted again. The instantaneous rate of increase of federal debt during 2010 was $1.6 trillion, found via the derivative of cubic interpolation of OMB data. During the first year of the Obama administration and the Pelosi-Reed Congress, the annual rate of increase was more than $3 trillion. That sounds like a big problem. The math isn't very easy, but the conclusion is. The debt ceiling can't be raised because raising it will not stop the rate of increase of federal consumption even if temporary spending cuts are agreed to. We have robbed the savings of our grandparents and children through inflation, high taxes, and careless spending on useless boondoggles. Both Bush administrations swelled the military-industrial complex to a frenzy while Obama and Clinton swelled entitlement programs. Cutting obsolete programs seemed out of the question. Both statist mindsets bankrupt the nation. Both main parties are killing the economy. The federal government gets revenue from only three means. The first way is taxation. Taxation brings discontent, dead weight loss, and is state-sponsored theft at the point of a gun. Taxation makes politicians more unpopular than they are already, and often undermines entrepreneurial activity by making firms at the margin less able to survive. It is a myth that firms pass on taxes to consumers. The slopes of the supply and demand curve assure firms must absorb a portion of the tax. The second way governments raise money is through monetary expansion. Monetary expansion causes the currency to be devalued over time at an uneven rate. This sets the seeds of business cycles, recessions, or depressions. This artificially encourages consumption and diminished savings. These effects are the enemy of firms who hire workers, they reduce reinvestment in plant and equipment, and causes innovation to suffer. Finally the government can borrow money. Borrowing fiddles with interest rates and causes firms who must pay risk premiums to compete with the government in loanable funds markets. Again, the negative economic effects are obvious. This graph shows federal expenditures and receipts starting from 1960 to 2010. Only those with a political agenda would argue that the government has been anything but profligate in its spending and ham-fisted in its taxation. It isn't a good idea to further slow an economy when it is in decline. Raising taxes, as the Obama administration and Washington Democrats demand, reduces the ability of firms to keep employees and satisfy customers. After all, taxes are the typical Keynesian mechanism to slow the economy when it is overheating. Taxes are out. Borrowing money to pay for debt makes no sense either even though that is exactly how we got in this economic morass. It crowds out firms seeking capital to improve or expand plant and equipment or to improve a process or product. Monetary expansion to pay for debt just means exchanging a debt for skyrocketing prices at the grocery store. These tools tear the economy apart by making business unpredictable and making interest rates reflect everything else except investment risk. Nobody can say the size of government was too small in 1990 or 2000. It was even arguably too big in 1960. We can return to a leaner government without starving children, denying education, or tossing granny off a cliff. One possibility is for the government to denationalize lands and property greedily kept from the use of the taxpayers who fund them. Here we see a map which outlines the land owned by the federal government. Currently, it owns nearly 650 million acres of land that is almost 30% of the land area of the United States. According to the April 27, 2011 issue of the New York Times, the federal government owns over 900,000 buildings. Again, just under a million buildings are owned by the federal government. 70,000 buildings are either underused or are empty at a cost of $1.8 billion. To make matters worse, the federal government has long-term leases on empty buildings. 
This is pure waste. It is suggested that the federal government return most of the land and buildings it holds to the state government where it is physically located. The federal government could then tax the state government on what they keep. If government ownership of the land is really that important, the state will happily pay the federal government for the right to withdraw the land from private ownership. This will provide revenue for the federal government and land control will devolve to the most local level. The Defense Department is also a prime area to cut. It is impossible to legitimately claim that the United States had a military that was too small in the year 2000. From this chart we see the annual rate of growth of software, equipment, and structures purchased by the federal government. A deep cut in defense spending would not make the United States more vulnerable. In fact, if we stopped meddling in the internal affairs of other nations, we would decrease resentment abroad and eliminate the debt which is the only real threat to the United States. Here we see the magnitude of the problem. This bar graph shows the spending on the top 10 militaries in the world. We can cut deeply and still outspend out next major competitor soundly. Trading swords for plowshares would clearly go a long way to solving economic woes. Yet most congressmen will not even consider trimming the fat in the military budget. This suggests they are not serious about correcting the debt threat. Federal, state, and local spending is out of control. Local politicians are more accountable to taxpayers than federal bureaucrats, and many states have balanced budget amendments. Sometimes though, balanced budget amendments are subverted when politicians spend recklessly, tax heavily, and take federal grants to offset the loss of businesses and enterprises caused by the state's destructive policies. Other states avoid spending freezes by declaring every proposed bill in its legislature an emergency. History teaches us this. The way a nation sustainably solves the debt crisis is through a humble foreign policy, highly limited federal spending, and policies that don't redistribute capital away from the productive sector. No tax money for non-productive ends like renting empty commercial real estate, subsidizing established industries, or grants to foreign leaders with lavish lifestyles.